Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us today. I apologize for the brief delay. Um, we were having some te technical difficulties, but we figured it out. So I'd like to introduce um, our speaker today. We have Deborah Meal, who is an intensively trained dialectical behavior therapist, DBT, and skills trainer. She is the founder and president of the Meal Foundation with 20 years of recovery and rehabilitation experience as a trained therapist. She will provide case examples and scientific evidence of DBT, the only treatment that has up to an 87% success rate with certain mood and personality disorders with co-occurring substance abuse. Deborah is co-author of the Friends and Family Bipolar Survival Guide and documentary presenter of the Life Focus TV series, A Mind Misunderstood. This workshop will explore directly and lovingly the ways in which DBT can be a pivotal factor in leading someone to stability. We will explore, expect, imagine, medication, DBT, and boundaries. Welcome, Deborah. Hi. Thank you for having me. Um, I want to start a little bit by telling you um, some of the things that we're going to be talking about. Um, this is going to be about dialectical behavioral therapy, and I'd certainly like everyone to know that when we, when I speak about bipolar and DBT, it's usually um, a, an hour and a half, three hours long. And I want everyone to understand that dialectical behavioral therapy, if you're doing it in an outpatient program, actually takes 26 weeks. So the concepts that I'm going to be talking about um, for this 45 minutes um, are the skills of DBT and a little bit about how the brain works and um, what you need to do to go forward. But I would like everyone to understand that the mindfulness, emotional regulation, the stress tolerance, and interpersonal relationship skills all come um, in six-week blocks um, because none of this, um, I tell all of my clients, is, is not like magic fairy dust. Um, it really does take a while to um, to understand the concepts and then be able to apply them. Um, first of all, I'd like to talk just very briefly because I think most of our audience understands what bipolar disorder is. Um, obviously, um, I'm going to date this webinar a little bit in the wake of um, Robin Williams' death this week. I think everybody is looking at um, bipolar depression. Um, and know that there is treatment. Um, there can be aggressive medication management, um, and suicide is just um, not the only option. Um, so bipolar depression can be difficult to treat. Um, the sadness, um, the anxiety, the irritability, the loss of appetite, loss of sex drive um, can be overwhelming. Um, but if you're seeing a doctor every two weeks, um, that is what we look at as a medication regimen and um, doctor regimen um, that can be very um, assertive and until you reach stabilization so that people don't lose hope because one of the things that depression robs you of, especially when bipolar disorder, um, is hope. Um, obviously, um, that being balanced with, um, you know, the manic excessive happiness, excitement, increased inter, you know, energy and irritability. But what we know scientifically is that our thoughts plus our emotion um, equal our behavior. And my next slide here is a picture, it's a spec image of the brain, which is called the ring of fire. And I tell people that brain chemistry directly relates to behavior. And so when you are able to change brain chemistry and spec imaging actually shows the areas of the brain um, that have, that are over excitable and the areas of the brain that don't receive blood flow. So we know that medication can turn on areas of the brain that need additional blood flow like your prefrontal cortex, which is your insight, your hindsight, and your foresight. And it can turn off the areas of the brain that, that, that what you see on the screen right now, that ring of fire, that overactivity, the right medication can calm that activity down so that people can live normal, productive lives. And again, it's not, um, it's not magic, 
but I want you to know that it really, um, with the right information um, and the right therapy, um, people can move forward. My next slide is about depression, and what I want you to know about from the, again, that top area where it looks like there's holes. There's actually not holes in the brain, but there's actually a lack of blood flow there. So when people tell you that they're unable to get out of bed, they feel sluggish, um, they're unable to think clearly, that top portion of the brain is your prefrontal cortex. And again, that prefrontal cortex is what supports your insight to your behaviors and to the world around you, your foresight, um, your insight, hindsight, and foresight is what then puts us in touch with the reality of cause and effect, knowing and being, being able to look at your mood and your emotion and your behavior. Um, this is obviously um, alcohol abuse. And again, you can just see um, within um, the brain where um, the alcohol abuse has caused the area of the brain to not have blood flow. So I think that that's important for everybody to understand and for families to understand that, again, um, the areas of the brain that don't get blood flow mean that there's no neuron activity there. And so when we can turn on the neuroactivity within the brain where there is no neuroactivity, people's behaviors change and um, their lives change. One of the things that DBT, um, the, the main goal of DBT is the ability to solve your problems. And there are four ways to solve any problem uh, is what DBT um, proposes. Um, you can solve the problem. You can change your emotional reaction to the pro problem. You can tolerate and accept the problem just the way it is, or you can stay miserable. Now, the interesting thing about DBT therapy versus regular cognitive behavioral therapy is that we don't spend as much time talking about the same thing over and over again and expecting different results. So clients that come and wish to participate in DBT know that they're going to be able to tell their story but what we, about their lives and their traumas and all of that. But we don't focus so much on what happened as we focus on the skills to move beyond what has happened. So one of the things that happens with people with bipolar disorder is that a lot of them have a problem with, um, with coping, with the lack of medication, with the lack of proper treatment, and pretty soon, um, after that's gone on for a number of years, you can develop a personality disorder. 50% um, of everybody with bipolar disorder also has and meets the criteria for borderline personality disorder. So one of the things that we have found with dialectical behavioral therapy in being able to help people with um, bipolar disorder is that lots of times if we can give them the skills to cope with the crisis that's going on around them, whether the crisis, and it doesn't matter in DBT if you've caused the crisis or if your environment has caused the crisis, we don't place any blame on that, um, is that you can then use the skills to move forward in life if you use the mindfulness, emotional regulation, and the stress tolerance skills that you can apply to your life and the things that are going around. because. We know that the environment um, doesn't change overnight. We know that our parents don't change the way they think. Our spouses don't change the way they think lots of times. Our bosses don't change the way we think. Um, so what skill are we going to use to be able to manage those things in our life that we virtually have no control over? So DBT looks at any and all of those problems um, in these four categories. and then. We look at DBT, how to solve the problem, and we look at what's missing from the knowing to the doing, and then we match the solutions to the goals. So it's very important for our clients that come to us, um, they can have the goal of, you know, I, I want to get better, I want to be able to control my emotions better, um, how am I going to be able to do that? How can, I, how can I help with my mood? How can I get on the right medication? How do I get to the right doctor? How do I help my spouse understand more about my illness, uh, my parents? 
Um, those are all um, goals that we look at uh, in regards to DBT. So the first um, core skill is mindfulness. Mindfulness, as it's practiced in DBT, is about awareness. We know that um, we are the only mammals so far that we've been able to find on the planet that can observe our own thinking. So the first step is to understand that you have the ability to observe your own thinking. Um, and DBT breaks that down into six steps. Again, it takes about six weeks to understand all of these steps. But I'll just give you a brief overview. Um, you observe something and then we immediately as human beings go to describe it because we have a file system in our brain that wants to do that. So if I say the word tree, a file opens up in your brain and you then begin sorting through all of the known trees um, that you can recognize. And um, then um, if I give you more information, you will select out of that file in your brain. Uh, the appropriate tree that, I'm, that I would be talking about. We do the same thing in regards to mindfully watching what we think. We have the same ability to do that. So one of the things that DBT states is that we don't, our brains aren't supposed to be like an unruly two-year-old in the supermarket. There are skills to actually, the what skills and the how skills of learning to be more mindful on an everyday basis, to understand what we're thinking about. So when somebody speaks to us and my brain wanders off, and as it normally will uh, when somebody talks to me, I will begin thinking about a variety of different things. I can think about the way they speak. I can think about their, their, their clothing. I can think about a variety of different things about how I'm going to interpret the information that I'm given. And I'm always not, and I'm not always right about my interpretation. And that's where the non-judgmental, one mindfully, um, starts to become an important factor of being mindful. Because if I have a wrong interpretation, I can guarantee you that my emotions are going to follow that wrong interpretation every time. And as I said, our thoughts plus our emotion equal our behavior. So the first goal within DBT is to focus on what works, and that's the effectiveness. Um, I act as skillfully as I can, but first of all, I have to be able to learn the skills. Um, I am always observant uh, and keeping my eye on the objective when I talk to someone. And then I let go of vengeance, useless anger, and righteousness that hurts me or that doesn't work. Now, that seems like a lot in regards to mindfulness and just being aware, but I want you to know that after a few weeks, it just gets easier and easier to be able to practice that. And we practice that in a variety of ways. I practice that when I return something or I have to exchange something at the supermarket. I practice that when I'm driving in my car. I practice that when I get a phone call um, from one of my loved ones that may or may not be in crisis. So I learn that to be open and non-judgmental, um, to not evaluate, um, to unplug my opinion um, from my conversations with people, that I'm actually able to meet that individual where they are in that moment without any preconceived ideas. And that, again, is another way that DBT is somewhat different, that cognitive behavioral therapy is that therapists practice this also. Um, and we don't assume that we know or understand where everybody is coming from in a particular moment. One of the things that we look at, um, it's my next slide, is our irrational beliefs. And I want you to know that this comes directly from REBT, which is Rational Emotive Behavioral Therapy. And Albert Ellis actually has a little test. It's 100 questions that are very easy, true and false. And you learn what your irrational beliefs are, um, such it's absolutely necessary for me to have love and acceptance for, from my family, or it's horrible when things don't go my way, or I should automatically feel fear and anxiety uh, with anything new or different. 
um, or my favorite, I must be unfailingly competent in all that I do. Those of us that tend to be a little uh, perfectionistic, um, being perfectionistic is a double-edged sword. It means that I really want to do the very best work that I can, but it also means that if I put a lot of pressure on myself, um, then I'll never be happy um, with anything um, unless it's 100% perfect. And in this reality and this universe, rarely is anything perfect. So we all have irrational beliefs. Um, we get those growing up as children usually because we have no prefrontal cortex. Um, until we reach the age of about eight. So we don't have any insight, hindsight, and foresight. So a lot of our irrational beliefs come uh, from our background, from our culture, from our education, from the people that we're around. And it's not that it's bad to have irrational beliefs. It's just that we have to be able to understand our own self-talk, such as it's horrible or I can't stand it or it's never going to be right or it's never going to get any better. Those are all things that we tell ourselves in our subconscious, and we have to be able to be mindfully aware of things if we want to combat the automatic negative thinking that we have, because there isn't a, a pill that takes care of automatic negative thinking. Um, there are things that can help, and our brain chemistry can help, so that we don't automatically go there, but it still takes practice, because we can get in the habit of automatic negative thinking, uh, and then it just becomes easy. That neural connection is formed in the brain for automatic negative thinking, and then we just go there every time something doesn't go our way. So how do I get to a place where I am no longer doing that? Well, I have to detach my beliefs um, from the outcome and my emotion from the outcome of what I want. Now, I will tell you that um, there's a lot of Buddhist teaching that teaches about um, uh, releasing my attachment to the outcome. 12 Step talks about radical acceptance. DBT talks about radical acceptance. There are a hundred scriptural beliefs about detaching my beliefs or my emotion from the outcome uh, to a particular event. Um, and it's not that I'm not supposed to want things to go a particular way. I am. I'm a human being. I have preferences. But when, it's, when my preference becomes so emotional that I'm unable to release it, um, then I start down that negative thinking path again. And what we learn in dialectical behavioral therapy is to have emotional regulation means that I can't be emotional about absolutely everything that crosses my path. So how do we get there? Um, we get there um, with a life in balance. Um, and we get there through emotional regulation. And <clears throat> emotional regulation is, quite frankly, about structure. And nobody likes to talk about structure. Um, it seems unfair that I should have to have structure in my life. It seems unfair that I should have to take medication every day. It seems unfair that I can't stay out until 2 o'clock in the morning when all of my friends stay out until 2 o'clock in the morning because I need more sleep. Um, and what happens is, is that I become mindful about that self-talk that I'm telling myself about all of those things. Um, so emotional regulation comes with, first of all, treating physical or mental illness, including those secondary personality disorders, um, and getting on the right medication, finding the right doctor. Um, I will tell you that um, DB, or, uh, uh, AA talks about HALT, hungry, angry, lonely, tired. If you are walking around hungry, angry, lonely, tired, you're not going to make good decisions. If you're walking around with a constant toothache, um, you're not going to make good decisions that day. You're going to become more irritable. Um, and so we have to look at emotional regulation about having our life in balance. Well, what happens when I become more irritable? Um, I uh, then yell at my boss or I don't show up for work. Um, something or other happens. I lose my job. I then have no way to pay my rent. I then have to call my family and I have to ask them if they can help me, which they've already helped me do before. Um, and then there's anger and resentments that are built up with all of that. Having emotional regulation, nobody ever gets this 100% perfect, whether you have a mental illness or you don't have a mental illness. But the idea is, is to start living your life in balance. 
and that means that I treat my physical illness. I I purposely spend more time um, laughing about things. I stay away from those sad movies where somebody dies at the end. Um, I don't listen to the country music, uh, like I said, where people, you know, the dog dies, the, the spouse cheats, and the farm burns down. I try to stay away from that. Um, I I get into balanced eating, um, and there's a lot of concepts about balanced eating. It doesn't have to be completely radical, but I tell people that if you uh, are eating ding-dongs and ho-hos in the morning um, and chugging it with chocolate milk, that that's not balanced eating. Um, it then triggers an insulin response, which triggers your dopamine response. Um, there is a peak that happens when we eat large quantities of carbohydrates or sugar, followed by a terrible crash, um, and then we wonder why our medication isn't working correctly. As human beings, we are not made to eat huge amounts of carbohydrates. We're just not. And if you take a Cinnabon and you dehydrate it and you shrink it and you put it on uh, and then you pour milk on it in the morning and you spoon it up with a spoon and you eat it, um, it's still a dessert. And I don't care how much fiber and how many vitamins you add to it, it's still a Cinnabon that's been dehydrated and shrunken that you're now eating with a spoon. So we have to look at balanced eating is one of those things that contributes um, to our emotional regulation or our unbalanced eating contributes to emotional dysregulation. Um, we avoid drugs um, that, again, uh, don't help us. So I tell all of my clients, um, this human body that you have, um, there is an input and an output. And everything that you take in to your body um, has to be filtered and broken down for your body to use it or for you to get rid of it. Your kidneys and your liver does most of that. And if you are then adding more drugs, um, more alcohol, more toxins to your body, you can't wonder why your brain doesn't work correctly um, because it is a manage, uh, it is directly related. Your brain does everything for you. And so what happens is, is that, again, uh, lots of times we have an irrational belief um, that um, it's not fair or um, it's not right that I shouldn't be able to do what all of my friends and my neighbors and my colleagues do, and there's a lot of drugs and alcohol that are legal. I should be able to do all of those. And I tell people, again, it's not about right and wrong. It's about what's effective. And living a life in balance is about what's effective for you. And so to continue to, um, you have to look at your thinking if you continue to do things that are ineffective in regards to your emotional regulation and why you are driven to do those things. Balanced sleep, um, incredibly important. Um, we know that, again, um, people can be psychotic uh, without enough sleep. Um, there needs to be a sleep routine for people. Um, you need to be in bed at about the same time. Um, it's important to try to be in bed before midnight uh, because of the circadian rhythm of the brain. Rarely do people do well that don't have structured sleep, um, especially with bipolar disorder. And more and more we're seeing psychiatrists um, that won't take clients that are bipolar that work the night shift. And that's because that they know that there is no medication that's going to make up for correct sleep. So what do I do if I am working a job where I absolutely have to work night shift? Um, then you're going to do everything possible um, to try to manage that until something changes in your life. We don't, again, force people. We don't tell them that it's right or wrong. But what we know is that usually night shift doesn't work very well with people with bipolar disorder. Now, that doesn't mean that you quit your job the next day um, if this is new information for you. It just means that you start looking at that and seeing how you're going to manage your life and if there is any way um, to possibly manage your sleep um, any better. Getting into a routine, um, a bedtime routine where you do the same thing every single day 
um, is very important. Your brain then has the ability to get ready to turn itself off, and that is really important. There's a lot of hypnotic drugs out um, that um, doctors have um, given. Um, there's more and more research um, that questions the um, people's addiction, if it triggers people's addiction to use those particular drugs. Um, again, what's right for one person isn't right for someone else. So we just like everyone to be aware of that. Um, I can tell you here um, at the Meal House, um, we don't use those type of drugs here, um, and we don't use benzodiazepines here So because of the problem with addiction. There are some other drugs out there that can be used instead. Um, our psychiatrist um, works um, uh, diligently to make sure that people have balanced sleep um, because without balanced sleep you're not going to have emotional regulation. And what we know about exercise is this. Um, it doesn't have to be horribly strenuous exercise. Um, the average um, amount of exercise that you need is you need to be able to take in a four-mile walk um, in an hour. Now you're not going to start out with doing that. 20 minutes is all that you need, but again, it pushes the blood flow to the brain. So you don't have to do horrible cardiac stuff. Um, you don't have to try to you know, sweat yourself to death. Um, none of that is effective long term. And quite frankly, people give up um, if it's too much because um, we are, again, behaviorally shaped by pain or pleasure. Um, and if exercise is too painful, um, people will not do it. Um, and then they give up, and we don't, we don't want that. All of these things um, that you do for emotional regulation is what gives you a balance of self-confidence and self-competency. And a lot of people with bipolar disorder struggle with their self-esteem. And one of the things that you can do that will in improve your self-esteem just enormously is to be able to get your life in balance. And again, um, this whole segment of emotional regulation takes six weeks uh, to teach, and it takes longer to actually get it um, in your life so that uh, you have a measure of emotional regulation. Um, interpersonal relationship um, skills are very interesting. I want you to know my husband is bipolar. Um, has bipolar disorder, however you'd like to say it, and he can tell you that um, struggling with interpersonal relationship skills was um, very difficult. Um, there is, I think, a segment of um, the bipolar population um, that um, has a difficulty with this, and my husband said it was always difficult for him to play in the sandbox well with others. And it's a skill, again, to be mindful of that, to recognize that, um, to not blame yourself for that, um, and um, continue to want to move forward to um, increase those skills. First of all, in any interpersonal relationship, um, there are three things that we look at when we communicate with people. Getting our objective met, um, the relationship effectiveness, and hopefully the self-respect at the end of a conversation that we have for somebody. So this is the example I give my clients. If I'm in Target, which has a, uh, what I consider to be a terrible policy uh, for returning items, um, I have three goals when I am talking to that individual. Um, my first goal is to get them to take the product back or to refund my money. Uh, relationship so effectiveness of acting in a way that the other person will some respect me. Uh, then I ask myself, do I want to keep this relationship or not? And the answer to that target is probably no, I don't need to keep the relationship. And my self-respect uh, is how do I want to feel after this particular interaction. So one of the things that I make a decision when I go into uh, target is which one of these things is most important to me when I get there. Because if it's my objective of getting my money or getting the exchange, then it doesn't matter about my self-respect and I can act however I want to act. I can throw myself around. Um, I can scream and yell. I can do all kinds of things. I can make everyone around me uncomfortable, um, hoping that my behavioral will move the person that I'm dealing with 
to want to get rid of me and just give me my money back or make the exchange. Now, the problem is long term, I may not feel very good about myself in doing that because um, I have, um, in a sense, manipulated the situation um, to go my way. Um, sometimes that's okay, but the idea here is that I'm mindful of it and it's not just um, lackadaisical that I, I just haven't done this because I'm in a habit of interacting with everyone this way. So the thing about interpersonal relationships is that we all want to get what we want out of a particular interaction and there's nothing wrong with that. It's not again about right or wrong, it's about what's effective. So I have to make a determination when I am in a relationship, whether it's at work or it's a family member or it's my children or it's my spouse, um, about what, a, what it is that I want. I have to be able to communicate it in a way um, that hopefully the other person will respect me. Um, and then also communicating it in a way when I don't get what I want, that I still have my self-respect at the end of that communication. And I will tell you that interpersonal relationship skills are, um, are a challenge to learn if we have spent the last 20 years doing it differently. Um, because it's very easy for us to go back to the fallback method of the way that we handled situations before. And one of the things um, that dialectical behavioral therapy does is it raises your threshold to um, to tolerate distress. And if I don't have my life in balance and I don't have my eating in balance and I don't have my emotions in balance, it's very difficult for me to tolerate the distress then of not getting what I want in a particular relationship. So one of the things that happens is when I'm communicating with people and I, you see up here I have ego, arrogance, and entitlement. That, doesn't, that isn't just a bipolar um, temperament, I want you to know. That is a temperament that is across the board. Um, we see our ego because we need a certain amount of security and survival. We need a certain amount of affection and esteem from people that we're around. And we need to have a sense, even if it's a very small sense, of power and control. So when I'm mindful when I'm speaking to somebody or I'm mindful about my thoughts or I'm mindful about a particular incident that's happened, um, if I'm broken down alongside of the road and I think that my security and my survival um, is at risk, let's say that I'm in a neighborhood that I feel uncomfortable in uh, and I think my security and my survival is at risk, how do you think I'm going to behave? Because remember our thoughts plus our emotions equal our behavior. So if I am having a conversation with somebody and I think that they have slighted me somehow, how do you think that our affection um, and our esteem comes into play to that? Um, if I have just lost a loved one or I have a child that's sick that I'm trying to find care for, how do you think my power and my control come into view that? Um, and I can just tell you that in any way that these three things happen with our security, with our esteem, with our power and control, my emotion will be triggered. And if my emotion is triggered and my thoughts will then follow that emotion, then my behavior then follows. So if I'm mindfully aware, then I can make new choices. So I tell people what happens when these things happen to us is I am either in fear, I'm in obligation, or I'm in guilt. So brain fog happens and I'm unable to think clearly. I'm unable to use my prefrontal cortex, which is my insight, my hindsight, and my foresight. And if I'm unable to access that part of my brain, that I'm running in that limbic system, I'm running in that reptilian part of my brain, so if I'm in fear, then I make decisions based upon that. If I'm in fear of being liked, then I will get on board with whatever it is that you're doing because I want you to like me. If I'm in obligation or guilt because I'm a parent and I have a child um, that is sick, 
uh, or a child that I can't get on the right medication. I'm in obligation and um, guilt. So we see a lot of behaviors that reinforce those things um, because, again, my emotions are running um, a particular situation. So, oh, well, that's an interesting hmm. slide. Oh, there we are. So um, what I say is, you know, I'm no longer willing to lose my self-respect, my children's well-being, uh, my home, my possessions, my safety. Uh, I'm not willing to lose any of those things uh, to preserve a relationship. I am learning how to appropriately and with a sense of high self-esteem choose to give. I'm learning I can occasionally decide to give up something during a conflict negotiation. But I'm no longer willing to mindlessly, and there's the word there, everything I have for the sake of relationships, for appearances, and in the name of love. And that comes from Melanie Beatty um, in her book, um, 12 Steps, um, Codependent 12 Steps. So as I learn to, um, as I learn emotional regulation, as I learn uh, distress tolerance, as I learn to set boundaries, as I learn to get out of fear and obligation and guilt, then my behaviors begin to change. Hang on one second. Well, I seem to have a freeze going on here. Well, as I continue to speak, I'm going to try to unfreeze my screen. Uh, and I'm going to use my distress tolerance skills. Because obviously, um, I had a problem with the screen and getting things set up. We actually started this presentation 15 minutes um, before um, all of you actually got onto this presentation. We had, one, we had several technical things that happened. Um, so even though we started early and we planned early, um, I now have a screen problem here. <laughs> so um, this is perfect time for me to talk about um, radical acceptance and um, distress tolerance. So at this moment, um, is as far as the distress is, uh, as far as my distress, um, I'm I'm going to be unable to um, quickly be able to take care of my screen freeze uh, that's happened for you to see my next slide. So I have to make a decision um, emotionally how I'm going to be able to handle that. So one of the things in distress tolerance is um, I have to be mindfully aware of how to turn my mind. Um, and I also have to have and be able to practice um, radical acceptance about a particular moment. So one of the things that happens uh, within radical acceptance is radical acceptance is about accepting the things I cannot change in that moment. Again, it's a it's an AA skill. It is a Buddhist concept. It's a Christian concept. Um, there a, are a variety of um, traditions, doctrines. Um, that all support radical acceptance. And I want you to know that radical acceptance uh, in DBT, as it's stated, is my only way out of hell. I have to be able to participate in the present moment and stay within the present moment for me to have a question, uh, for me to have a idea about how radical acceptance is going to work uh, in my life. So radical acceptance means that I participate by accepting reality the way that it is in this particular moment. What I tell all of my clients is that there are many things about this universe, um, about uh, this particular um, structure uh, that we live in on this planet that I may or may not like. I have a lot of questions about the way things are going to run, but I do know and understand that there is a law of cause and effect. And most of the time, unless it's a miracle, 
the loss, cause, and effect is always in place, and things uh, move forward in a particular way. So I have to decide to tolerate the moments that I don't like with a certain measure of success. And again, I'm going to tell everybody that distress tolerance uh, is a, another six weeks of learning material to be able to take the steps necessary to learn to turn your mind. Now, you can't turn your mind into any type of radical acceptance if you're not mindfully aware. So again, that's why mindfulness is the core concept of DBT. And to be able to turn the mind means that I have gotten to a fork in the road and I've decided that, again, it's not about right or wrong, but it's about what's effective in the moment. So turning my mind means that I don't have to like something. It means that just in that moment, I have to tolerate the way that it is. And that takes a level of emotional maturity to be able to do that. And But you can't do it if you don't have the skills um, to practice that. And what happens is, is that I evaluate in my mindfulness whether I am willing or I'm willful. And we all have a certain amount of willfulness in our, in our brains. We um, want things to go a particular way. So willfulness is giving up. Willfulness is the opposite of doing what works. Willfulness um, for people that are codependent are trying to fix every situation because we're not going to fix every situation. There's no way that we can. When I look at back at the four ways to solve any problem, I know that I can't fix another human being. I can hopefully give them skills. I can lead them um, to a different outcome. But I'm not going to necessarily be able to, to fix something. And willfulness is refusing to tolerate a moment in time. And I refuse to do that um, by acting in a way that makes the situation worse. Willingness, on the other hand, is doing just what's needed in each situation. It's listening carefully to what DBT says, our wise mind. And our wise mind is using our prefrontal cortex, our insight, hindsight, and foresight, along with our emotional regulation. And if I use our insight, my insight, hindsight, and foresight with my emotion, that I'm able to make more appropriate decisions. And I'm able then um, to, as I tell my clients, if you're in a hole and you want to get out of the hole, stop digging. So if I'm in a situation that I don't want to be in, I don't have to beat myself up. I don't have to blame anyone else. The only thing I have to do is to be mindful to what the next right step is. And if I don't know what the next right step is, I ask somebody. I ask a therapist. I ask somebody that's more trained than I am in regards to what I should do next. Um, I think that that is um, right at um, 45 minutes. Um, and so I'd like to open it up now uh, for any questions. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Hello. Thank you so much, Deborah, for that presentation. Um, questions are now coming in. Hang on just a moment. There was a question that was asked very early on in your PowerPoint, and that is, and hopefully this makes sense at this point, um, which area is not getting blood flow in regard to the brain? Oh, um, well, in that, um, let me see if I can move back, if I can show you one of the slides. Absolutely. Uh, that's an excellent question. Um, do you see the slide with the alcohol abuse there? Those areas that look like holes are actually areas that have no blood flow. 
um, in this depression slide right here. Those um, areas, again, that look like holes are actually no blood flow to the brain. And if there's no blood flow to that particular area of the brain, there's no neurotransmitters at work there. And so, again, we know that um, our thoughts plus our emotion equal our behavior. So I tell people that when you look at that and you then say to yourself, well, you know, this person has depression, um, this person isn't acting um, very, um, you know, enthusiastic about life, I say, well, I'm not really surprised because here's this whole area of the brain that has no blood flow. I probably wouldn't be acting very well either at that point. So what we know is that there's medication that can actually turn on those areas so that people, again, um, do have um, hope and they are able to live a functionally normal life. Great, thank you for that answer. And the next question, I'm very interested in DBT. Is this a treatment that I can learn on my own rather than go to a psychologist? Um, I would say um, you can. There's a lot of um, self-help guides out there. But here is the way that an intensively trained team works. If you are doing the skills segment that takes um, two hours and then the therapist is the person that actually brings those skills out of you. So the idea with the therapy is that your therapist should be leading and helping you pick skills and use skills in every area of your life. So even though you can learn it, through a self-help book, and there are a bazillion out there on, M on Amazon, learning the skill isn't necessarily applying the skill. And you can learn a certain amount of the skills, but I would certainly encourage you um, to get in a, um, with a therapist, and it doesn't have to be a psychologist. Um, there are a lot of LPCs out there that are trained, that are intensively trained in DBT, and that's what you're looking for is an intensively trained therapist who can actually help you apply those skills to your life. And that's what makes a big, big um, change in people's um, lives. Thank you. The next question back to the blood flow. Um, if there is no blood flow to certain parts of, of a person's brain, how are these parts not atrophied or dead? Um, they can atrophy, and what we know with bipolar disorder is that the longer that you go with, without medication, uh, the more that you can lose actually gray matter in your brain. And so over long periods of time, and I don't know what that number is, um, that would be a really great question for Dr. Daniel Amen. Um, how long can it go? Um, I'm not sh I don't know. Uh, but I can tell you that um, they have studied brains um, that um, have people that have had bipolar disorder that have found without medication, and they do lose a certain amount of gray matter in their brain. Thank you. The next question, to what extent are parents involved in DBT therapy of a bipolar young, young adult child? Um, they can be absolutely involved um, 100%. I um, have actually led groups um, where I had teenagers in DBT, and we put all the teenagers together, and then we ran a parents group. So the parents group was actually learning the skills at the same time um, that their child uh, was learning uh, the skills. I can tell you that um, Yale actually started DBT um, with two-year-old and four-year-old, and they did it. Um, I was actually in Seattle, Washington at a training where they talked about doing it with little smiley faces and stickers. So um, emotional regulation and stress tolerance um, can absolutely be taught to a four-year-old. And, um, and all of those parents that were within those programs uh, were actually learning those skills also so that they were being reinforced at home. Um, I'm a huge proponent of family members, whether it's spouses um, or parents, um, to learn the skills so that um, they can be a part of the treatment team. DBT is very much a team approach. Um, there's psychiatrists, um, therapists, 
um, nutrition, um, you know, exercise. I mean, we we are a, we are a team of uh, professionals that are all in the same, you know, with the same goal to be able to help our clients um, have a life in balance. Great, thank you. Um, the next question, is DBT a therapy exclusively for bipolar or has it been effective for other conditions? Um, it's not exclusively for bipolar. In fact, um, DBT um, wasn't um, technically even recognized um, for bipolar disorder for some time. Um, there was a study that was just completed um, by Canada. Um, we've been using DBT for about eight years because it only made sense to us. Um, again, 50% uh, of the population with um, bipolar disorder also has borderline personality disorder. DBT was originally formulated for borderline personality disorder, but now we recognize that it has significant uh, uh, research has been done for just depression and anxiety and ADHD, uh, that these concepts are concepts that across the board um, help people change their lives. Great. Um, next question. You have you demonstrated the impact of alcohol. What is the typical impact of marijuana? Um, don't support the self-medicating, but want to understand. Right. Um, you know, it's very interesting. I uh, tell people that you know when they call me, uh, and people have what we call um, self-medicated. Um, and I um, have a couple of slides on marijuana, as I do on methamphetamine. Um, I will tell you that, again, as human beings, um, we are motivated by pain or pleasure. And if the pain is bad enough, we'll do whatever it takes to get out of that emotional pain. And people that self-medicate um, usually still haven't found the right stabilizing drugs um, to treat uh, their bipolar disorder. So I call it uppers, downers, and mood stabilizers. Um, people that tend to be a bit more manic um, use alcohol uh, because they find that it helps. People um, that are depressed tend to use cocaine and methamphetamine. Uh, people that are up and down uh, tend to smoke pot. We know that short term, those things uh, can make a difference. Um, but long term, uh, they can be extraordinarily addicting. So the AMA still says that uh, marijuana is not addicting. Uh, but I can tell you on scans for people that have used, um, and um, again, we're not talking about a one-time use, but we're talking a lifetime of use, um, shows the same type of uh, lack of blood flow to certain areas of the brain. Um, what I would hope is that we can have a conversation, um, an honest conversation between clients and healthcare professionals, i.e. the psychiatrist, in what they're doing so that the psychiatrist can help that individual um, get on better drugs, more controlled um, synthetic medication instead of having to self-medicate. That's what we really want. We want an honest conversation. We want psychiatrists that don't shame uh, clients because we know that when that happens, then nobody is honest. And so it's about um, opening up a discussion again so that everyone can be part of the team. Great, thank you. Um, the next question, how involved should spouses be um, in the DBT training process? Well, I say it's how involved that you want to be. I will tell you that um, um, spouses that choose to learn the DBT skills, um, as long as they're not trying to beat them, um, your, your partner over the head with them, uh, can be extraordinarily helpful. So you can be as helpful as your um, partner wants you to be. Um, but if you are learning the DBT skills because um, you're going to try to fix that individual, um, I would tell you to possibly reconsider that. Um, learning the DBT skills is useful. Um, it's probably what saved Mark's and my marriage. 
because I was able to separate um, from his illness and learn to take care of myself, which is what I needed to do. Um, because I, you know, I'm shamefully codependent in many areas, and I had to learn to not be codependent in many areas. I needed to learn to be an advocate. And DBT gave me the skills to be able to do that. So when Mark and I started uh, in this process, and I became, later on, became a DBT therapist, but we actually saw a therapist. He saw a therapist one day a week. I saw the same therapist one day a week. And we saw the therapist a third day of the week. Now, I realize not everybody's able to do that. Um, but I will tell you that that is absolutely what it was um, that turned it around for us. Um, and um, we have an amazing relationship, an amazing marriage. And I can just tell you that uh, as the loved one uh, to somebody that has bipolar disorder, um, you can have an absolutely amazing, fulfilling relationship. Oh, that's great to hear. Um, next question, what is borderline personality disorder? Um, personality disorders are considered maladaptive coping styles. So people with borderline personality disorder have a um, a way of looking at the world. Um, it usually comes from trauma, and goodness knows a lot of our um, people with bipolar disorder have had trauma, uh, a lot because they haven't been understood, and a lot of because of behaviors that they've had. But people with borderline personality disorder have, um, of the criteria, um, frantic efforts to avoid real or imagined abandonment. Uh, they feel that people are going to leave them. A pattern of unstable and intense interpersonal relationships, um, and um, we, which is followed by black and white thinking. Uh, they have a really unstable um, sense of themselves um, or self-image. They have impulsivity in at least two areas of their life. They have reoccurrent suicidal behaviors, gestures, or threats. Um, and so I tell people um, that looks like the, um, the gentleman who calls home and he says, hey, honey, um, I'm going to stop off tonight and I'm going to have a, a beer with my buddies. And the woman says, or man says, because uh, it's certainly not gender related, um, you just don't love me anymore, do you? And he says, excuse me? <laughs> yeah, I do. I mean, what are you talking about? well, you know, I, you do this, and I feel this way about it, and, um, you know, I'm just going to, you know, jump off the next bridge. I'm going to kill myself. Those threats um, become that person's way of dealing with things that they don't like. And those um, threats, again, suicidal behavior threats or self-mutilating behavior are part of that one uh, personality disorder. Um, effective in, uh, stability uh, to marked reactivity of mood, intense episodes of irritability or anxiety, chronic feelings of emptiness, inappropriate anger, and, um, and then the, the last one, the ninth one, is paranoid ideation. So um, of that nine criteria, you only have to have five to actually um, have borderline uh, be classified as borderline personality disorder. But if you have less than five, then you can have quote unquote features of a personality disorder. So you can have bipolar disorder and you can have features of being narcissistic. You can have bipolar disorder and have features of being histrionic. You can have bipolar disorder and have features of borderline personality disorder, which about 50% of the population has of, bi of the bipolar uh, population. And what doctors say is that they look at bipolar disorder and borderline personality disorder, and they say in some regards they're on the same spectrum. That intense irritability, um, a tense, um, again, mood swings, uh, intense, um, uh, unstable self-image, uh, patterns of unstable interpersonal relationships, um, lots of times um, many bipolars have those.
is there another question? Oh, I'm, so, I'm sorry. I... Yes, the next question. What is the first step that you recommend to clients with bipolar disorder focusing on DBT? Sleep control, exercise? Um, it depends on the goal of the client. Every client is different. Um, the first thing that I recommend is obviously um, learning the skills, but the goals are always individual um, to the client. Um, sleep is, of course, um, one of the most important things to get regulated. Um, nobody functions well without sleep. Um, so uh, we look at what the client's goals are, and that's how we proceed in the treatment plan. Unlike regular cognitive behavioral therapy, um, uh, I've had clients say to me, you know, my goal is, you know, I you know, want to want to be in a relationship and want to be able to be married one day. Uh, that's my number one goal. And I said, okay, then we're going to work on your interpersonal relationship skills so that you can obviously be able to keep a relationship because you haven't been able to do that in the past. So that's what we put all of the focus on. Great, thank you. Next question, is there data for effectiveness of DBT in bipolar disorder? There is. Um, there's a um, Canada research um, that was just released, I want to say, uh, within six months. And um, if I'd be happy to send that information, if you contact me um, through the Mail Foundation, I'll be happy to send you out that research paper. Great, thank you. What do you recommend um, in terms of the best way to find out about DBT opportunities, um, therapy opportunities? in a particular area. Right. Um, there's a great website where all intensively trained DBT therapists are listed. Now, these are not therapists that have just taken a weekend two-hour class. Um, these are therapists that went through six months of intensive training at Behavioral Tech in Seattle, Washington. So you can go to www.behavioraltechtech.com. And you will see on that site, um, you'll see Marshall Linehan, who is the founder of DBT. And on that site, you'll be able to click a button that says, find a DBT therapist in my state. And by state, intensively trained DBT therapist listed. Wonderful. Thank you. Do you regularly have written and agreed treatment plans with your clients? Do I have what? Do you have written um, treatment plans, written and agreed? Yeah. Okay, great, thank you. Um, let's see, one last question. How does your method compare, or the DBT, I suppose, um, compare to John Kabat-Zinn's mindfulness? Of, of whose mindfulness? Possibly you're not familiar. Um, John Kabat-Zinn? Oh, yes. Um, uh, we, uh, the, it, there's a lot of it that's probably a lot uh, similar. Um, I am familiar with him. The interesting thing about DBT is that DBT is broken up into steps. I struggled with meditation and mindfulness um, for a number of years trying to figure out what it was that I was supposed to do. And the interesting thing about DBT is DBT breaks it down into um, steps that you can actually take um, to develop that skill of mindfulness. Um, it's one thing to be mindful. It's another thing to be mindful and then have an action plan about how I'm going to change things. And that's how I think DBT is a little different. And how DBT is used as a therapy, because you actually have a trained therapist that understands mood disorders um, and understands personality disorders that are, that are then helping you apply the skills to then change your life. And that's where DBT goes a step further. Wonderful, Deborah. Thank you very much for your presentation today. And I do want to remind everyone that um, this is recorded, has been recorded, and will be uploaded to our website this afternoon. And I will also um, attempt to upload her entire PowerPoint. Um, Absolutely. Available for your viewing, um, and with which also will include her contact information at the Meal Foundation. 
Um, thank you so much and um, have a wonderful day. Thank you.